What I do is inconsequential. Why I do what I do is I get to shorten people's journeys every day. What I love about our hospitality industry is that it's our mission to make people feel cared for while on their journeys. Together, we'll explore what hospitality means in the built environment, in business, and in our daily lives. I'm Dan Ryan, and this is Defining Hospitality. Today's guest is passionate about creating immersive design experiences. He's an industry thought leader. He's 2018's Hip Designer of the Year from Interior Design Magazine. He is the design director at Rote Studio. Ladies and gentlemen, James Cull. Welcome, James. Hey, Dan. Thanks All for right. having me. I'm good. I'm well, good. thanks. For, thank you for being here. Um, look, we've known each other for a really long time. You've been on a really cool career path. Um, which I want to get into, but I think one of the most exciting projects from an industry perspective that I'm just really excited to have worked with you and your team on or your teams on um, is this new Marriott headquarters hotel. Because if we really step back and think about Marriott moving from uh, the office park in Bethesda to downtown and this being one of Arnie Sorensen's last model rooms that he was involved in as a, as a hospitality industry leader. And then you guys coming in and really making a hotel right next to the mothership. I mean, that's a huge undertaking and responsibility, I think, for the industry. So first of all, I just I just really want to talk about that and kind of hear about your experience there. But then, you know, just kind of see where the, the conversation goes. But like, I'm just happy and honored to have you here. So thank you. Well, thank you. I'm happy and honored to be here. And I was very happy and honored and excited and nervous to get that Marriott project, of course, being right next to the mothership, as you say it. Um, it was a big deal and, and there were a lot of eyes on that project. And um, it was kind of interesting to see Marriott reaffirm their roots in Bethesda, which I thought was really um, kind of a beautiful story. And that kind of was the genesis of a lot of the concepts for that hotel, which were quite abstract. Um, we usually try to root our design in a sense of place and location. Um, you know, in context of the local architecture and history and the building that it's going to live within and all that. So to, to try to understand what does Bethesda mean to Marriott um, in terms of Maryland, but also kind of looking at the historical meaning of Bethesda, we discovered that it was, um, you know, there's the, the famous fountain in um, Israel of, of Bethesda, and it's a, a place of kind of well-being and um, rebirth. And we wanted this um, kind of it also means like the house of kindness and so that kind of became our driving force and our mindset the bumpers kind of on our bowling alley in a way to design this space that always went back to like this idea of hospitality and, and it makes sense for Marriott which owns multiple brands um, for us to really kind of dive back in and what does hospitality mean for Marriott in 2022 as they're kind of um, starting this new chapter in this new location yeah <sighs> it is a new chapter. It is a new location. I think on so many different levels, um, just from attracting younger workers or teammates that work there, just, just from an ease of getting to there from a public transportation point of view, um, I think it's also going to reinvigorate, not that Bethesda needed any reinvigoration. It's a, it's a pretty vibrant downtown, but just having them come back to the center of downtown or not, or just go to the center of downtown. I think it's a pretty incredible story. And then from, I guess, when you first were that, you said you were like nervous and, and honored to get it. I think it, so that's, those are pretty weighty feelings. Um, when you were first coming up and solving those design challenges that you mentioned, how did, like, what was your, I, I'm really curious to see like what your first impression was and then all the feedback, because you must've gotten so much feedback, not just from the owners of the hotel, but also from Marriott and like just finding that equilibrium where everyone is happy. Cause I'm just hearing the greatest reviews from everyone that's been in the hotel from Marriott and or Marriott. And they're all so excited. So like, how did you balance that initial, okay, this is how we're going to do it. And then getting all of that feedback because there must've been so much to where now it's just getting, I don't know, just blown up by everyone in like the most positive way. Yeah. I mean, I think that's always the the challenge and the, I don't want to use the word fear because that seems like a strong word, but there's this a bit of a, a pre-opening anxiety and did we make all the right choices and these projects take years and with the pandemic, 
um, took even longer for us to get the doors open. And you hope that like it, the design still resonates and feels fresh and works for the hotel and for the, for the end user. Um, yeah. And then what, what were some of the biggest um, changes from your first go at it to where everything wound it up? You know, it's interesting. I think the big design gestures from day one are, are still there. Um, when you walk in the front door, and you mentioned earlier about the hotel kind of being in downtown Bethesda, um, it, it straddles, it actually goes through the whole block and it straddles Woodmont in Wisconsin. So it, it feels in a strange way, like the center of the center of Bethesda and they've created, um, Gensler was the architect and they were working on the office tower and the architecture of the hotel. They created this kind of plaza alleyway that connects the two avenues. Um, so they, I think in a way are promoting you know, people gathering here in this, what we call this house of kindness. Um, and it's interesting to hear everyone in the neighborhood as well, excited um, that there's a new venue there. And one thing um, I think that's really special about the hotel is there's this kind of express elevator that's tucked around the corner um, that will take you to the penthouse. And there's a rooftop bar there, which is not, not common, or I don't think there even is one in Bethesda. And it's kind of cool to go up there um, and get this, these views of, of the city and you can look back to DC and get a sense of context of where you are. Yeah, I'm very excited to go up there and I can't wait to, I'm already trying to like plan a happy hour or something up there that, you know, we can all just celebrate and, and have yeah. fun. Um, so one of the other things that I'm really intrigued by is, you know, getting noticed by Interior Design Magazine in 2019 as hip designer of the year. Um, that's a huge um accolade right that's a really big deal and just to think about i know like you didn't just hatch out of an egg and hey i'm i'm james cull and i get this big award like as far as your your path towards that and then your continued path who are some of your big um mentors and inspirations because i really think we all stand on the shoulders of those before us and i just love to hear more about that and if you can just share it with other just so other people can hear about who are coming into our industry as well at this exciting time i mean i, I do have kind of a strange journey i started out wait did um, you really hatch out of an egg exactly <laughs> <laughs> first of his kind um no but you know i started out in very young um my mother is a mentor for sure of mine and she promoted that i study and dive into anything that really interests me and I think when you are young and you're trying to discover yourself, it took me down several paths of um, kind of left brain, right brain thinking. I, I did a lot of art. I ended up going to um, a second kind of like, I don't know what the type of term is, but it was like a, a second school that really focused on the arts. It was an arts and science academy um, and studying art. And at the same time, I was taking classes at a local university, anatomy and physiology classes. And so I clearly didn't know if I wanted to be an artist or a doctor, but I think it was activating these synapses on both sides of my brain. And I think to this day, that's still very much a part of how I think. Um, and so I ended up going to um, undergraduate school for, for medicine, actually. Um, and I was fascinated by medicine and the body. And I still am, um, have a, a big interest in it. And I think two years into my pre-med, I woke up one day just thinking, you know, as much as I'm interested in, in science and how things work, um, I didn't want to be stuck in a hospital working those shifts. Um, and I think it kind of that that was the crossover to me thinking a bit about like how things work in terms of how a building is constructed. So in some way in my mind, I've, I've kind of created a link between the two. Um, I ended up graduating with a degree in art history um, from undergrad and working and moving to New York, of course, to work in the galleries uh, like in like West Chelsea, selling artwork. Um, and I did that for five or six years. And um, one day just thought, you know, I was reading in the news about Pratt Institute was the number one program in the country for interior design. And i had always had like kind of an interest in it. My mother is an interior designer. And so I think it's always been part of my, my subconscious. And I thought, hey, why not like maybe do a summer class and see if I really like it. Um, and I did and I loved it. And I ended up enrolling, like I think we finished in August and I started in September. And that's really what led me to this, to my career is, is that degree, obviously in interior design. And Pratt was an amazing institute. It's a, it's, it has a great reputation. They have um, amazing art departments, interiors, architecture, a lot of different kind of um, 
types of design that, and there's, they promote crossover. Mm -hmm. um, so it really was like a, an amazing experience for me and, and quite abstract. I mean, most of our, uh, well, wait, I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm intrigued. You said they promote crossover and you're just like, what does that actually mean? I mean, there, there's interaction between the departments and depending on what your course is, like I took a course that um, I forget what they called it, but it was like an interdisciplinary course where we had industrial designers, architects, interior designers, graphic designers, textile designers, all in the same room. And we collaborated on a project. I think at that time, our project was uh, a high-speed rail, like a train. Um, it was probably in the news. I don't know if Obama was talking about <laughs> expanding our rail network. And so it was interesting. We had people designing all different facets of the train coming together with these uh, you know, different experiences, different uh, perspectives and different talents. Um, and to see how many different trades and people it takes to put together these complex things. And I think hotels are in a way very similar, right? The amount of tradesmen and expertise you need from like the mechanical and everything hidden in the ceiling down to, you know, the fabric on the chair. And I think that's a really interesting point because if you really get down to what hotels are, hotels are just buildings. There's nothing special about them. It's just a building, a core and shell. But then you come in and really, you know, I love that you kept saying, uh, this kind of house of kindness and and that feeling of warmth like how do you like from all of that experience how did you learn how to take a very sterile austere thing and make it feel warm and kind i mean that is always the challenge and i think why there often is a different um interiors like designer on on a project like a hotel um is because we are so kind of well-versed in that we do it every day and I think for us um, having that warmth means there has to be some authenticity and to have some authenticity you really have to dive back to the roots and I think this is where my art history part of my brain I guess my brain is quite subdivided but for me like researching Bethesda and what it meant historically what it meant for Maryland what it was like how it developed why it was there um, you know a lot of these towns that are just uh, just outside of cities like DC, um, you know, or Buckhead in Atlanta, they, they, they were actually like a one day's journey in a carriage away from the city. So it was a pit stop for many people for a very long time. They would stop and rest their head, have dinner. There was an inn there. So it, this is, I guess, our 21st century inn, which is uh, the new headquarters hotel. I just feel like going back into study, so like for art history, as you were saying, um, you getting down and studying the roots and finding those everyone uses this word authentic or whatever oftentimes it's overused but when you can really get down to the core meaning of something whether it's a town a history um just the etymology of a word and then you can get down to that base kernel of the truth of where it's from then i feel like you've tapped into that authenticity and that's the art history and then you kind of you build your whole um experience you build your whole for you that you build the interiors from that and i think that that's a really um it's a just a really cool it's not like it's a surprise it's but it's like it's just good to hear that digging deeper and getting to that truth is really where the authenticity is well i, I mean i think there's two parallel tracks there's the more aesthetic um approach to design um which almost some, sometimes or often comes secondary to understanding like I said, the customer and the brand and what, what are the ethos of the brand? Because, you know, Marriott has a huge umbrella of brands and they all are attracting slightly different subsets of, of, of our, our country or the world and trying to understand who that customer is. Why are they coming to this location so that you can tailor the design and all these aesthetic things to um, something a bit more specific than just a hotel guest, right? And at the Marriott Headquarters Hotel, I think it's attracting a couple subsects of people. There's people staying regionally, people that are coming home to see their family, people that live in the metro area. They'll probably have what host weddings there um, and, and cultural events and you know things for the community. And just next door, you have the, the headquarters, the office tower. And so of course, there's gonna have, you're gonna have people coming for all of these brands to the property. Uh, and one thing that's actually quite interesting about the hotel is that there is a floor in the hotel that's not ac accessible to the guests. Um, and from an engineering perspective, it's really interesting because we've kind of created these huge cavities in the floor um, that allows them to build these prototype rooms. So there could be a Ritz-Carlton room or a, 
Marriott room or a Renaissance room on property. And then as those brands release new strategies and kind of configurations or testing things, they can reconfigure the rooms right on site and give, you know, these, these owners that are coming to tour uh, just across from the hotel tower, like an experience of this is what the new future of, you know, whatever brand it may be um, kind of fully realized in a room that that's functioning. Oh, wow. So it's so quite it's interesting. Kind of, that's pretty amazing. So it's like a, almost like a laboratory from your pre-med days, right? You're just <laughs> a little eye of eye of newt and wing of bat and uh, but it's right there. So they don't have to travel far and then they can see it. Oh, for sure. I mean, it definitely, uh, pings the nerdy part of my brain a little bit to think about that because that that's always the logistical challenges like you know all this stuff that the guest doesn't see how do you integrate it in a seamless way that's effortless so that they don't have to worry about anything and can live in these interiors that I hope at the end of the day these interiors and these experiences that people come into and in a hotel they're staying for a short period of time so you can have a bit of fun that they leave those those nights at the hotel with like a different understanding or that it changes their perception of space or that it makes them think about um, design or a city in a different way, that it enriches the experience without smacking you in the face. I don't want it to be, ever be cliche, but you want to kind of interest people. Um, and, and there's a romance in that, that I think ties back to this idea of hospitality and making people feel comfortable in a space that they're not typically because it's they're not familiar with it. Yeah. And I, I think about um, just from an aesthetic point of view, because you brought that up many times, if when I first entered the industry, I don't know, 20 something years ago, and you go work on a Marriott project, there was always, it always had, you were kind of bound in by, it's got to be like, I forget what color it was like, Hunter Green and Burgundy has to be somewhere. And then everyone would kind of design for, with that palette in mind, for whatever reason. And it's amazing just to see over the, 20 years and now with the whole move into uh downtown bethesda and this new hotel and just the acquisition of starwood how they've really as an outsider looking in invested so heavily in all of those different brands and it's really segmenting out all those different brands and it's, i don't know it's just kind of cool that they're able to do that and differentiate and i'm just like it, it's pretty amazing that they've been able to accomplish all of that yeah, I think for a while, all of these big brands were developing new brands for, for so long. And so it's kind of interesting to see them christen this site with like the OG Marriott and kind of go back to their roots, but like reevaluate their roots and, and what is the future of, of Marriott. And I think there is something to be said about the, the, the capital M on the sign out front that it, that it is a, it's a Marriott and you're at Marriott headquarters and it's not one of their lifestyle brands. Um, that they've kind of reinvested in, in a way. And I think that that's why there was so much attention on, on the project. And we were getting attention from people we don't typically get attention from. Um, everyone was so curious about what we were going to do and how we were going to execute it. And we were really lucky. We had, um, you know, the, the finishing of the interiors is, is of a pretty high quality. Everything looks really great. It feels really great. The proportions of the space are very gracious. Um, inviting a lot of light in. And you can kind of imagine, um, we've created these, you know, the house of kindness. So that, that was one of our abstract principles that drove the space planning. And so you come in and there's kind of an entry foyer and there's a living room and there's like a lounge and there's a private club and a restaurant and typical kind of program, but um, all within one space in this hotel. Um, kind of like how we live nowadays. People don't live in segmented homes or don't build segmented homes like, they did in you know in the past things are it's kind of like a loft living and so you could imagine lounging and working and socializing and eating all in the same kind of lobby space um which i think is really exciting it, it feels very energized even just in the earliest days um you can see people kind of taking advantage of all the little nooks and crannies we designed totally and i love that activation and just big open space and you know that's a real development just over the past, I don't know, 10 years or so, 10 or 10 or 12 years. Um, when you think about, you get, you're, you're working on this sterile, austere corn and shell, right? And then you're, you do your research, you know, your inner art historian is digging down to trying to find those kernels. And then you're, you find, you get down to this idea of house of kindness for this project or for any, whatever it is for any project. Um, and then you're, you're taking that to, build this hotel like 
in all of that learning and all the different varied projects that you've done, how have you learned to define what hospitality is? Like, how do you define hospitality? Oh my God, that's a loaded question. I mean, I think it, it really is anticipating your guest need. I, I mean, I love to entertain at home. And so I guess maybe I tie it back to how I would want to feel when I'm welcomed in someone's home. Um, and I like the hotel to feel like that level of warmth, as you said earlier, that you're, you feel welcomed in. The furniture is welcoming. It's comfortable. The seat height is appropriate for the table. Like I said, kind of anticipating how people will work or need to function in the space. And I think this working remotely has changed the way people experience space. And so we had to create those moments that could, could swing from like a lounge and having a cocktail with a friend to like someone popping open a laptop and, and kind of working. Um, you know, in the guest room design, we, we have this pretty cool feature. We had a shaft that was quite um, cumbersome in the room and it was like expressing itself inside the bathroom and in the, in the bedroom area. And, and we, no one really liked the way it looked. And so we ended up um, curving the walls in there and they're yeah. lined with wa walnut and the walnut is like a tree that's indigenous to the, the, the that region um, and and so even the furniture and the architecture is really kind of hugging you and I think that that it's subtle it's it's not something I expect a guest to kind of pick up on but I think that reinforces this idea of like the building itself is kind of anticipating you and hugging you and making you feel comfortable yeah, and, I, I actually love that curved element in the room because when I went in there, it was super surprising to me because I'm like, wow, you never see anything like this. I, typically in North American projects, you know, you're limited by, you know, whatever walls and soffits there may be, but there's not a lot of just a lot of built in features where you can like really change the whole feeling of the room. And it was, I didn't realize it was because of some other HVAC stuff, but, uh, that curved element really, it just makes the room feel so incredibly different and like warm in a way. It's weird. Yeah, and I mean, I think the wood finish definitely helps with that. I think also the distortion of space because there is no like shadow in the corner because there is no corner um, makes the room feel larger than it really is too. And I think when you're sitting there, we have this kind of, um, you know, Kagan-esque curved sofa with a table a power nearby or adjacent like you can imagine sitting there working or having a glass of wine at the end of the night and and feeling like you have a full expanse of view and the windows are floor to ceiling and bringing in a lot of light i think this the room itself feels spacious because of that very subtle gesture uh, uh, absolutely i totally agree okay so now i just want to go back to you i know you, you said your mom is a mentor um as you finish up pratt um, and then you're starting to work in interior design. Like, what was your experience there? Like, how, how did your journey go from Pratt to where you are now at, at Rote? So I was, um, as every other member of my class, doing a thesis panel review, uh, my final thesis in my third year. Um, and they invite outside jurors in. And um, I had a juror from, um, well, I had several jurors from different firms. And one of them left a card um, at the desk. Um, they didn't even hand it to me after the review. And so I was talking to, um, to one of the professors and, and I was notified that there was a card there. So I picked it up and it was a card for Yabba Pusheberg. And so someone on my panel had apparently liked what I had presented and left their card. And so I, I gave them a call, they weren't hiring, um, but she thought it would be worthwhile. Um, her name is Lizette Valoria. I don't know if you know her, but she's at Rockwell now. Um, amazing woman. Um, taught me a lot, actually. Ended up getting me in for an informational interview. And I was not meant to, to meet George or Glenn that day, but Glenn kind of burst into the room. And wow. I was presenting my thesis, which was uh, urban transportation. <laughs> and he, he said, you know, we don't, we don't design subway stations here. We design luxury hotels. And, and I said, I know, and, and I love your work. And it just kind of was kismet. It was very happenstance in a way how it all fell together. Um, I was like at the right place at the right time. And I think so much of success sometimes hinges on those moments that you have to kind of seize. And so I started working there and I worked there for about five or six years. Um, and they were definitely big mentors to me and, and kind of educating me. I, we always joked that it was kind of like a second graduate degree. Um, and, and they really promote this kind of studio environment and, and learning and researching. And I think a lot of my kind of baseline thinking or thought process when I, when I start projects probably originated with some of those ideas that I, I learned there. Um, 
And then after working there for some time, I, I was approached by Rote Studio and met with uh, David Davis here and Lauren Rote, who are, are my definite big mentors as well and, and have taught me a lot about business and design and, um, and, and, and that's what led me here really. And, and now in this role, um, I'm, I'm quite lucky. I, I get to oversee about a dozen projects and we don't have a house style at Rote. Um, which can be intimidating, but it's also kind of liberating because we do, you know, I just finished a resort a couple of years ago in the Caribbean for Belmont, which is a quite, um, I don't want to say traditional brand because they're very forward thinking, especially since they were bought by LVMH, but, um, you know, a little bit more of a transitional style. And at the same time, I'm designing showrooms that are designed with like light and drywall and kind of everything in between. And so that, that I find very exciting um, about this role is that I get to kind of dabble in a lot of different styles and periods and aesthetics and that keeps it all fresh you know i think the thing about design is if it if it's not fresh it, it it's a lot of work so you have to be passionate about each project and that keeps me very interested yeah and just to hear you just you know, i mean just throw off those mentors of yours george glenn david lauren like those are incredible that you had those just those four people I don't know very many people who have had such a incredible um, path to where they are now by having such magnificent mentors. I mean, that's that's super amazing. And I, I agree. You said it's luck and then you kind of backed off that. I really think that like luck is where hard work and preparation and opportunity kind of intersect, right? So you've been in the right place at the right time, but based on all the hard work that you've done. Yeah, for sure. In my life experiences, I feel very fortunate and I, I'm, I'm definitely a hard worker and an overachiever by nature and um, maybe a little OCD when it comes to design. And I've, I've worked really hard to get here, but I also like have to recognize uh, all of the people that have kind of prepped me for all these different things, starting like in my early childhood and having a mother who really encouraged me to think outside the box and not like hold me back. I think that mindset that, you know, if you can teach your kids that from a young age, I think they approach the world in a different way. Um, and it allowed me to kind of just feel like fearless about design. And I still feel that way now that, um, you know, I really like listen and think a lot about what the brands and my owners are saying. But I, I also, I feel like I do push people a little bit to think outside the box because I, I would like to always kind of continue the conversation or push the conver conversation forward. Yeah, as you're saying, I don't know, it, most people are probably listening to this, but as you're saying, think outside the box, I'm looking at the, the painting behind you. And it's like this exploded line drawing of a cube or house. Yeah. And it's really <laughs> like, it's funny, like you're saying, think outside the box. This box is like exploding and creating new opportunity and allowing new opportunity in. And um, I don't know, I just love, I love the image that I'm seeing as I'm talking to you and, and hearing you talk about that. Um, I didn't plan that. I think no, you know, I, I think I know you didn't, but it's <laughs> but you know you selected it, and maybe somewhere in your unconscious, it's you've said think outside the box, and you know right side, left side brain, like all of this stuff. Somehow in your unconscious, that painting wound up on that wall because uh, you're you're a believer and practitioner in all of this. I mean, my 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 studio is very minimal, and it's kind of like a blank canvas, and. I think I like how messy this kind of feels. And I like a little bit of that wabi-sabi. There's like a beauty in, in, in some parts of the things not being perfect, right? Because that's that brings in the human touch, really. Yeah. And then, you know, and the, where, you're, where you're seeing and, and embracing this idea of things not being perfect, when I think about like where you first started interior design with Yabu Pusherberg, like I'm such a huge fan of the, the projects that they do, mostly because the attention to detail is so perfect, right? It's just like from just reveals to just all the different architectural elements and the lighting. And then even they've been so successful at just designing product that fits in with their whole aesthetic and getting out there. And I don't know very many firms that have been able to do the projects that they've done, but then also have like a really cool cadre of just designed products as well. It's, it's really, it's cool. And that's a great place to kind of, um, I guess, earn your chops, so to speak. Yeah, cut, or cut your teeth, as they say. I, I, I definitely agree. And I think I was there at the time when I think there was an evolution in the thought process of like what that studio meant and how it was going to function in the future. And 
they hired industrial designers and textile designers and accessory designers and architects and they have a lighting department and they really decided like to dive into the pool and be like a completely multidisciplinary firm and I think a lot of firms claim to be but they really do function in that way and I think that's really interesting and I think one thing I mean working at Rote that you know I said we don't have a house style we also work in a huge variety of, like of typologies of project types I mean I just finished renovating the New York Stock Exchange last year which is um, an interesting project because it's like a historical renovation, but it's also like an office. Product. God, I had no idea. Yeah. Wow. Um, so that, I mean, like I'm doing office projects. We do a ton of hospitality. I'm designing a, a couple little cigar private cigar clubs that you know are interesting in restaurants and bars. And we do residential, multifamily residential. We mm. last year we were very lucky to have um, the number one and number two selling residential developments in, in all of New York City. And one is Central Park Tower, which is like the super modern, tallest all residential building in the world, right on Central Park South. And the other um, is a, a more traditional or transitional style with um, the building architect is Robert Stern. And the interiors are a completely different aesthetic. Um, so it's just kind of interesting to see that like, regardless of the, the project brief and the location that you can do good design in any style in any location. A hundred percent. It's funny, as you were talking about, um, it's not, not funny, it just kind of made me think of this idea of a multidisciplinary firm. Were you at the, did you go to the Platinum Circle Awards this past year um, when Larry Traxler got like that Lifetime Achievement Award? Yeah. So I just remember him always talking when he grew up in Chicago, or I think he grew up in Ohio, but then he, he worked at this place called Jordan Mosier um, with a bunch of other people from our industry as well, where they were doing like, they were casting metal lamps and, and chandeliers and they were actually drawing and designing everything and then actually like doing the metal work and doing the carpentry and like they really built everything. And if you look at like him and a bunch of other people that came from that place and how they've gone to all of these other places, it's pretty amazing. And then I think about where you are now at Rote and the growth that I've just been seeing you guys go through and like the amazing projects you're working on. Um, how are you attracting talent right now? And how do you, you, Lauren and David, like, how do you impart your knowledge and like um, really help inspire and impact the new crews coming in so that they, you help them become the best versions of themselves? Yeah, I mean, we're always looking for talent. Shout out if anyone's looking for a job, send us a resume. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think the thing about us is we are kind of, you know, we're, we're multidisciplinary too. And I think on my team, I have um, kind of, I have an urban designer, I have multiple architects, interiors, people that come from a more residential background, people that are more corporate. Our, our firm's practice is very multidisciplinary. I mentioned we do residential, commercial, hospitality, we would do cruise ships. Um, and for years, there has been discussions about, you know, making a hotel feel more residential. And then after that, it was like, uh, resi commercial design because people wanted their you know offices to feel more like home and or have like a hospitality on I mean, a lot of our big offices now have a bar in them and so I think it's really kind of interesting to see all these different facets of design start to intersect and overlap and I think it was accelerated by this pandemic because I think everyone started to work in a very non-traditional way it'll be interesting when the pendulum starts to swing back like see where we end up but I think there's just a lot of flexibility and openness and there's not as strong boundaries between different disciplines like of design or within like design as a whole that like maybe to do the best design you need experts in all different types of design coming together um, so that an interiors person isn't just doing interiors and the landscape's not just doing landscape or a textile designer is not like designing in isolation and I think in a way the interiors often especially in the hospitality world gets kind of roped into to being that ringleader um, we're the ones bringing a lot of these different ideas together and kind of driving this narrative always and presenting to the, to the brands. And so I think it's, it's exciting. I mean, I love that, um, weaving together all these disparate elements so that it's one kind of story from the second you, your foot steps and hits the pavement at the front door and the portico share, like up to your room that there's that narrative thread throughout the whole experience. 
I love it. And then I, and then really you're, you are a textile designer because you're weaving all these great people together. To, <laughs> I like that. That was good. Yeah. Yeah, you're, right. you're weaving all these people together and, and bringing all these different um, disciplines together so that like, if I was a young you coming out of Pratt and, and working for you, or not working for you. If I was a young you and I was looking at what 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 else out there after I have my, my degree, uh, there are places where, you know, you're going to get trapped. You're going to get, um, I don't know, pigeonholed into doing a thing, right? Whereas if I'm hearing you correctly, what's really cool is you have so many different um, experts in so many different areas that okay, I'm not going to do that one thing. I'm going to be able to to experience so many more things and just really kind of uh, develop my palate and creative ability further. And I mean, this is a hospitality podcast. I really do have to give credit to hospitality because I think of all the different areas of design I've worked in, hospitality brings together like residential, there's a room, people sleep in it. It has somewhere, they have to eat somewhere. So there's restaurant design, they go to the spa, there's a gym, there's ballrooms. I mean, all the different programmatic components of a hotel I think has allowed me to kind of see beyond the confines of one particular subset of design and kind of find that way. We, we talk about it being kind of like an orchestra or a symphony or whatever. You have to get all these different instruments to sound great and work great together and have that experience be completely seamless is um, a great challenge, but it's also, I think is the most fascinating thing. And it, it's prevented me maybe from becoming pigeonholed into being like a designer that specializes in one particular thing, like a spa or residential or, you know what I mean? I totally know what you mean. And actually, it made me go back to what you were saying before about working on that Belmont Hotel, um, because it is a distinct brand. And the fact that LVMH, who is like the king or queen of all brands and have like the best brands under their umbrella, if I think about hospitality and kind of where you lit up right there as you were talking about hospitality and paying homage to hospitality, it's really the ultimate immersive experience, especially if you're a brand. So if you're... If you are uh, LVMH and you have all these different brands, like why not have a hotel for each of them? Because you can really control what the guests are seeing, smelling, seeing, breathing, hearing, and they're actually sleeping in it. It's like it's it's unbelievable. I'm I'm actually surprised that there haven't been more um, brands that have developed their own hotels. What's your thoughts on that? I mean, uh, there are a couple. Um... I think the danger is becoming a cliche of yourself. And I think you can't have a room kind of monogrammed in a particular brand. I think there's a lot of power in fashion. And I think there's definitely a lot of, there's a huge audience for fashion, right? And you can see with all these different brands, they have their own kind of identity and personality. And I think it definitely translates into opportunities for hospitality. I'm not sure I want to sleep in a completely branded room. I think that there's but somebody a danger does. In, Someone does. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's just a danger in becoming too, too focused, but LVMH has a, an amazing roster of brands. And I think Belmont itself, I mean, the roots of that brand, it was called, I think originally the Orient Express hotel group and yep. they own the original Orient Express train, um, which is even more crazy when you think about a, ho a train on or a hotel on, on a train track and moving. Uh, how does that operate? Um, but they have this crazy legacy and this history and the, property that we developed um, was a resort and you talked about like immersive experiences and I think a resort is is totally immersive um, because you know an urban hotel you step out the front door there might be a, a sidewalk or a cafe or something um, but it kind of stops at the curb but a resort really is is everything and the guests especially in a tropical environment are indoor outdoor the entire time so our or kind of little box that were maybe boxed into interiors is, is definitely exploded in a resort environment because you're designing right out to the, to the waterline, you know, at the beach. Totally. And I'm actually, I'm smiling right now because I'm envisioning, I did know that uh, Bell Mines or Origins was the uh, Orient Express train. And that is like the ultimate luxury, immersive moving experience. But when you were, when you were putting on your art history hat and like digging deep into Belmont, did you dust off your, uh, your thesis on transportation? <laughs> I mean, it, it definitely made me think about it. And I, I think there's the art history story in me is like fascinated by kind of history. And so I love the nostalgia of train travel, I think it's just like really beautiful and magical. And 
Um, I was so very excited to work with this brand. And I think if you look at their, their collection of properties, um, and I think this is why LVMH acquired them is like each one is kind of its own brand and it has its own identity. There's a Bellman philosophy in terms of the way that they approach the customer and all of that, but it's kind of invisible really. And you get to these different properties and each one has such a distinct personality. It feels like a personal project for someone that someone built this hotel and it's very distinct and different from all every other Belmont property. And, you know, they have the Orient Express train. They have a glass roof train that goes to the rooftop in Peru. They have the original Cipriani's in Venice. So when you start to like review the list of their, their properties, it's, it's really insane. I love how you say it's really invisible because I, unlike you, like I, I consider you an expert in designing for hospitality. For oftentimes I find it best when it's invisible and I really just tap right into that feeling. Um, and I think the job that you have and with all the teams that you're developing and inspiring and impacting, it's like, how do you, through your review process, help your teams and the people who are coming up under you as, as a mentor, um, tap into that invisibility of it so that you really, um, the people who are going to be walking through these spaces can just feel it. I mean, I, I love mentorship and I love fostering a studio environment here and, and talking through things and debating things. And I often encourage my designers to challenge me and we, we kind of hash things out um, together to figure out the best solution for things. Um, I'm very much a big promoter of, of sending them to, to experience things. And we do hotel tours and we visit different properties. We travel art, art shows or exhibitions at museums and we pull all of our kind of experience and our influences from a wide range of, of, of things. It's not like just a hotel tour could influence the design or approach to a hotel. Um, yeah. And now, as you said, the museum tour, like I'm, I really need a trip to the Met. It's been too long since moving out of the city because I just walk into there for a half day, a couple hours or a full day. And I'm just so inspired by not just all the different aesthetics and medium, but also just the different time periods. So thank you for that. I'm making that on my to-do list. I got to get yeah. back to the Met, so thank you. We need to get back to, I mean, I think the past two years have been challenging, but I think seeing the, the city kind of come alive again in the last month or two makes me want to get back out there and you know, visit a museum, tour, travel, all those things that we haven't done in so long. Yes, all of the above. D, all of the above. Um, so as you think about, as, as you're just like digging into the future there and envisioning it, like what's, what's exciting you most about the future? I think it is a bit of the breakdown and like the formality of things that you could work from anywhere. I, if you had asked me before all of this, if I could work from home, I think I'm so hands-on um, and I still sketch every day and print, print out drawings and redline, not on a computer, um, that I, I, I never thought that I could actually work anywhere outside of my studio, but I travel quite a bit now and living through the last two years has taught me I can just work almost anywhere. There's obviously days you need to be in the studio and reviewing things together at a table, a different kind of um, connection or synapses are, are activated when you're in person. But I, I realized I could do quite a bit, um, you know, from anywhere in the world. And, and that's kind of liberating. And I think when it comes to design and how we think about things, um, I think that that's going to influence how people um, design the spaces and, and having spaces that people could work, um, giving people that flexibility to go visit their family or take a trip, but still work their nine to five during the day. And how do we accommodate that in the room? So it's not like the traditional desk facing a wall. So we think about that quite a bit and creating a, a really kind of rich, warm um, experience for people that is flexible for whatever I, you're doing there. You just surprised me because I, not that I thought anything one way or the other, but I, I just loved hearing that you're so analog and that you review with printed paper and pen. Because when I write, I find my best writing is when I'm using a pen and paper. There's something about that tactile experience that I just, I love. And, it, and the pen to the paper to me inspires me in so many other ways. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a very big firm believer in printing it out because it, it your hand is like, you know, connected to your body and it, it, I don't know, there's something that comes out of it that that ink that's different than a keyboard or a mouse. And um, I think, you know, in a computer, things are digitized in a way that you draw straight lines perfectly and you your curve is perfect. And 
I think drawing by hand like liberates you from all that and there's a lot more freedom um, and you can produce I think more stuff more quickly more ideas more quickly when you're when you're sketching it out so I I encourage all of my designers to sketch and we I sketch on cocktail napkins on flights and at airport lounges often um, and take pictures and send them around and I find it's just a really great easy way to communicate um, really and quickly for me like when I'm talking to people I'm doing these maps and there's something about um the gesture so it's imperfect it's a big mess but like when i'm looking at it it's almost tapping into the memory and going back to the beginning of our conversation where you said you know you're both left brain and right brain i remember like i got super into i i had my mom was an is an artist so you know i was always surrounded by and experiencing art but i always felt oh i couldn't do it and then i think i was in sixth grade i had a teacher miss stanky she got this book called drawing from the right side of the brain which i see everywhere and it's really turning an image upside down and drawing it so that you're disassociated from what the actual form is that you're drawing and you're really just looking at shapes. It helped me become an artist. And I loved that. And to think about the pen on the paper um, and the gestures and the emotion and just the feeling that you actually get, I feel like it's lost. So how are you keeping it? Aside from like encouraging your, um, your teams to sketch as much as possible. Do you, do you see a lot of pushback with the younger kids and have any really taken to sketching and drawing? I mean, I, I think I, I grew up in between generations of this like technological, I don't know, change in the world. Like I grew up typing my original term papers on typewriters. And then I remember a phase when we got a computer. And so I definitely have, I guess, more tools at my disposal than these young kids that are, are amazing on the computer. I mean, really the stuff they can produce is mind blowing, but they, they grew up with that technology. Probably they don't remember a time before it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's just fostering that studio environment. Like, you know, I wish I could show you our space right now. Maybe I can send you some photos, but it's very open. Um, we have a, cu a couple niches that have pinup walls and when we review, I, I make the team bring all the finishes. I want to touch the finish while we're talking about the finish and talk through the detailing and how we're going to make it, how we're going to detail it. Um, we print out things to full scale on our plotter. So when we're studying a, a vanity for a, a hotel guest room, we, we print it out full scale. We tack it up on the wall. We make sure that the height is appropriate. Where's it going to hit on your hip? You know, all these things that I think are really important that are hard to see in a computer because you know, you're limited to the computer screen, right? And <laughs> totally. so you can produce these amazing photorealistic renderings that look more realistic than a photograph, um, but you don't have that level of detail and that nuance that at the end of the day, that's what the, the guests are touching and feeling and remembering because it's what their bodies physically coming in contact with. And I think that to me is, is the ultimate luxury when you think to that level of detail. You know, we, we program the space, we design the space so it does everything it needs to do. But that attention to detail that shows someone took the time to like consider that level of detail is a luxury in today's world. Awesome. Um, when you think back to James Cole working in a gallery in West Chelsea. So let's just say you're walking up to yourself now you're walking up to your younger self in a, in a gallery in West Chelsea, what advice do you give yourself? Hmm. I mean, I think at that moment, it's hard because I think my instinct is to tell me not to, to, to think beyond my, my life at that moment, but I think I had already started to feel that way. And that, I think that that's what subconsciously led me to like signing up for that summer course at one moment was just, embracing that that part of me that I think in somehow I suppressed I mean I grew up in a small town in the midwest and um you know I said my mom was a designer and I think that that profession maybe wasn't like as respected as I think the respect that it deserves because I think some people have this like notion that we just like pick out pillows and furniture but design is so much more than that and because it's so thought through and carefully considered and like you say invisible people don't realize the amount of effort that goes into every single decision and we're making you know in a hotel we make a, a million decisions that have to be documented and executed um i think because of that i i i don't want to say avoided it but i just never really saw it as a realistic um profession for me. And I think maybe the advice I'd give myself is just trust your instincts and listen to that inner voice. Cause I think I always knew I was into design. I remember, 
you know, renovating our, my bedroom with my mom and her letting me pick out every finish and furniture and how intrigued I was by it at the time. But I guess I never really thought of it as a profession. I just thought of it as like my bedroom, you know, because I was yeah, 10. Well, and also going with that left and right brain kind of mentality, it's, uh, yeah, it's a profession, but it's also a passion and you've been able to pursue both. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's the advice I give anyone that comes to me, you know, I mentor, um, you know, I do guest juries at Pratt and I'm part of this Be Originals um, nonprofit that has like a mentorship program. So I receive, you know, students here and people asking me like, you know, why would I want to go into design or do I want to go into design or, you know, what's it like? And I, my advice is always the same. I'm like, you have to love it. People don't succeed in design unless you love it because the hours can be long and the amount of detail I said is, is excruciating at times, but if you love it, it doesn't feel painful. It, it feels exciting and it feels like you're creating something. And I think there's a beauty in kind of willing something into existence that's physical, that's there, that people experience, and it kind of lives on and has its own life. And to me, that's what motivates me. Awesome. And then I want, I want you to go back to being that uh, textile I want you to have a piece of thread in your hand right now. And just from like, again, to have mentors and inspirations of uh, David, Lauren, George, and Glenn, like if you were to take that piece of thread and uh, thread it through all four of those names, like what's a common theme for how they helped you become the person that you are? I think all of them approach design with like a seriousness. And, and I think that goes back to this idea of having like a lot of passion with a seriousness that I really just respect. I mean, they're all, they've all had very successful careers, obviously. They're all at the top of their game. And, and I think that's inspiring to see, you know, it takes a lot of work to get these projects built and in budget. And, you know, half the time I'm arguing with a contractor and a hard hat on, on a job site. And, it's not always the easiest uh, arguments or battles to be won, but I think it takes a lot of perseverance and de determination. And I think I also admire, you know, that they all have gone out on their own and created firms with their name on the door that are successful. And there's, there's a lot to be said about that because this is a tough industry and I really it's respect that. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think of the four, I know David the best and there's like this warmth about him that I just, really adore right and i would think you know you hear about all these visionaries within our industry or just design in design forget hospitality but all design and there's this kind of like element of uncompromising vision which could also lean towards being tyrannical right but when i although i know david the most i've never heard any of that amongst david lauren george or glenn in the sense that like, whenever I hear stories about them, they're always said with this idea of, and feeling of warmth as well, which I think is unusual because they, they do have uncompromising vision in what they've built and achieved, but there's also like this uh, chatter and feeling of warmth whenever you speak to anyone about how, who has worked with them or who has um, experienced them or has, has had them as a consultant on a project. And I just find that I'm just very, um, interested in that it's very um unusual i think i mean i'm definitely a people person and i'm attracted to i guess maybe like-minded people or people i admire um and and they're all lovely and i think that's why i i worked for i mean at both firms now i think five or six years each um and have stayed and really feel invested in in these different brands or firms or whatever you want to call them and it, it, it comes back to the people the culture in the office that we foster and the different type of talent we we bring on and and I think that there's a work hard play hard kind of mentality and and I think that that's really important that office culture and maybe even more so now after or uh, so many people working at home for so long uh, I was dying to get back into the studio and, and see people again and I think in the hospitality world so much of what we talk about is interacting with people um and so maybe that's why you know both of these firms do so much hospitality is because they're the mindset of the firm is, is perfectly programmed for that type of a task. Totally. Totally. I agree. And, and also just a very um, clear vision and amazing track record as well. Um, so James, as we kind of wind up, how can people connect with you? 
I mean, typical channels I'm on Instagram, although I don't post very much anymore. Um, I'm on there and um, LinkedIn for sure. And then, you know, through our company website, of course, if someone wants to send a portfolio through, um, we're looking awesome. for people. Yeah. And we'll put it in there. And I love your Instagram handle, Culmination, right? <laughs> you know, I feel like I was an early adopter of Instagram and I still love it, but um, I guess I just like going on there to see what other people are doing. I don't really share as much about my personal life anymore. Well, um, I was just referring but... to your handle. I, it's, it's just great. Culmination. It's, it's, I love it. Yeah, the last name lends itself to to a couple of different you know plays on word. I think culture is another one people have used in the past. So oh, Double and that's L. really what's drawn you to where you are and on your journey too is that attraction to culture. Hmm. Well, and I think my last name too. I think symbolically, I think the word "cull" is to to like they well, you'd call like a herd of sheep, right? And take up to find the best of the best. So yeah, <laughs> it was <laughs> awesome. it was a good name that was given to me. I love it. The best of the best. Well, hey, James, I just want to say thank you so much for your time. I know how busy you are and just all the great projects that you're working on. Uh, but thank you for sharing your experience, not just with me, but with everyone else out there that wants to follow their passion. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure talking to you. Great conversation, as awesome. always. Oh, thank you. And also, most importantly, I want to thank our listeners. Uh, I really hope that this talk has evolved your uh, thinking on hospitality, especially in the built environment and also helped you take a step towards following your passion. So if it did, please share this podcast with a friend. And thank you, everyone. We will see you next time.